Faith in the Fog is based on an excellent sermon series presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. It was one of the most dramatic head-to-head -head battles ever seen. All the onlookers would know once and for all who was real and who was fake. The days of talking were over. The times of posturing were done. The gauntlet had been thrown down. The claims of dominance had been called into question. One side used intimidation techniques and personal attacks to gain their reputation with the people. They had numbers, and they struck fear in the hearts of all who lived in the country. The other side hid in obscurity for months, forgotten about by most. He was a simple man who wore a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. The people were once a strong nation, but had taken substantial losses in the last couple of years. After that day, there would never be a question. God sent his humble servant to reveal the truth once and for all. No one had seen him in three and a half years. The last time they saw him, he proclaimed that there would be no rain to fall on the land until he spoke to the rain to come down again. This was significant because the false gods the people worshipped were gods of nature and fertility. God took on their gods at the exact point where the people worshipped them. God's servant, who had followed God's instructions in hiding, is now coming back home and calling out their gods once more. Elijah laid down the challenge. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Then Elijah challenged the gathered crowd. I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. The challenge accepted. The battle began. After half a day of dancing, praying, and cutting themselves, the prophets of Baal admit defeat. It is now Elijah's turn. He built his altar and prepared his sacrifice. At this point, Elijah doused his altar with 12 large jars filled with water. He would leave no doubt about the miracle because wet wood would not burn. 
Elijah didn't perform a grandiose religious production, like the prophets of Baal. He simply said a simple prayer, and heaven answered. Suddenly, fire fell from heaven on the altar and consumed the sacrifice, the wood, and the whole altar. When the people saw this miracle, they fell on their faces before the Lord and cried, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! Then Elijah commanded the people to seize the prophets of Baal and slaughter them in the Kishon Valley. One would think that this moment would be a tremendous faith builder for Elijah. But sometimes, at the greatest moment of your success, a spiritual fog sets in. Jezebel, the queen of Israel, upon hearing what Elijah had done, sent a messenger to Elijah, threatening to kill him in the same way he had the prophets of Baal killed. What Elijah does next is confusing. Fear gripped his heart and he ran for his life. Why would Elijah be afraid of Jezebel? He confronted Ahab, the king of Israel, and caused him to yield. Why be afraid? Let's speculate. Elijah was a familiar figure at the court of Ahab. His garb and manner identified him as a prophet. While at Ahab's court, Elijah prophesied to the king that a drought would parch the land because of his sin. Following the direction of God, Elijah hid himself in the ravines east of the Jordan River. For three years, Elijah lived in hiding, while Jezebel, the queen of Israel, was killing off the Lord's prophets. We can infer that Jezebel was killing the prophets in an attempt to murder Elijah. No doubt, Elijah heard the stories of these massacres, and these stories became seeds of fear sown deep in his heart. So, when Elijah heard that Jezebel wanted him dead, his fear came to the surface and formed a dense spiritual fog. His mind clouded and panic set in. Therefore, he ran for his life. Elijah was in the fog of depression, running aimlessly, driven on by his fear. Let me ask a question. Was Elijah clinically depressed? The Mayo Clinic reports that depression is a persistent feeling of sadness or loss of interest. Depression can lead to a wide range of behavioral and physical symptoms which includes changes in sleep, appetite, energy level, concentration, or self-esteem. Depression can also be associated with thoughts of suicide. People who are depressed may experience anxiety, guilt, or hopelessness. They have erratic sleep patterns, loss of appetite, or fatigue. People who are depressed also are driven to social isolation with feelings of dejection and wrestle with thoughts of suicide. Again, 
Was Elijah clinically depressed? Let's see. No doubt, Elijah was overwhelmed with hopelessness by the job before him. The nation of Israel seemed to repent, and they will need a prophet to re-educate them. He was filled with self-doubt and questioned his ability to complete the task. Elijah failed to see that God is all that he would need. Elijah's first reaction with hearing Jezebel's threat was to seek social isolation deep in the desert. For one day, he ran until he collapsed out of exhaustion under a broom tree, being overwhelmed with feelings of hopelessness and dejection, he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I have had enough. I want to die. These are the comments of one who is contemplating suicide. Elijah was also struggling with emotions of self-pity. Let's read. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The internal evidence extracted from this narrative seems to point to the possibility that Elijah suffered from a bipolar disorder. Elijah would have high manic episodes but when he slipped into depression, it would be a dark and arid desert of despair and hopelessness. Elijah would have benefited from a prescription of Prozac. The one smart thing Elijah did while dealing with his depression is that he sought God in prayer. While in the cave on Mount Horeb, God met with Elijah in a gentle whisper. The totality of what transpired in the cave is not recorded. But eventually, Elijah's fears were quieted. But he received instructions to anoint Hazel and Jehu as kings and to anoint Elisha as a prophet to succeed him. Simply stated, this episode between God and Elijah caused Elijah to lose his ministry. Remember, there are consequences to our actions. The first step in navigating the fog of depression is seek God. When human effort and reason fails, seek God. Find a safe place and pour out your heart to the Lord. This may seem too simple-minded, but it is the first step you need to take. Without God, you only prolong your season of depression. What is it that overwhelmed Elijah. Why would a simple threat from a wicked queen cause Elijah to respond with such fear? No doubt, Elijah was wrestling with loss and grief. He believed that all members of the school of the prophets were dead. Elijah knew these prophets. They were his friends, and he thought, that all was lost with their deaths. 
But God chided Elijah with the fact that 7,000 in Israel had not worshipped Baal. No doubt that among these 7,000 were members of the school of the prophets. The school had not been destroyed. Sometimes, amid our grief and loss, the fog of depression will distort the truth. What is a midlife crisis? A midlife crisis is a transition of identity and self-confidence that can occur in middle-aged individuals, usually between the ages of 45 to 64. It is common to see individuals experience feelings of depression, remorse, and anxiety. While Elijah was under the broom bush, he made a statement that causes me to think that he was experiencing a midlife crisis. He mumbled that he was no better than his ancestors. What could Elijah mean by this statement? What ancestors could he be referring to? There can be only one logical answer. Israel's deceased prophets. Elijah saw himself as no different than the prophets who had gone before him. He lost the war for the souls of Israel. He lost his fellow prophets, and now he is facing the loss of his own life. Little is known about Elijah's early days. He probably associated with the school of the prophets when he was called by God. He probably began his ministry with great zeal to change the world. Thus, a midlife crisis when Elijah reached middle age. Sometimes the reality of life doesn't match up with our youthful dreams. In the end, Elijah realized that he was no different than his ancestors. The threat of Jezebel was only the match that set off the explosion of Elijah's midlife crisis. He was overwhelmed with grief, loss, and hopelessness. He ran because he no longer had an optimistic view of the future. Elijah ran until he found a safe place in the cave on Mount Horeb. And in this cave, he poured out his heart to God. It was in this cave that God nursed Elijah back to physical and emotional health. But it was also in this cave that Elijah was commanded by God to anoint Elisha as a prophet to succeed him. Elijah wanted out. He was done. God heard his prayer and selected Elisha. Simply stated, Elijah lost his ministry. It's so important that should you be surrounded by a dense fog of depression, that you don't act irrationally. Don't make major decisions in regards to your church, employment, or family because the truth will often be distorted by your depression. Find a safe place and pour out your heart to God. He will listen. There are several examples in the Bible where individuals are seen pouring out their hearts to God during seasons of fear and depression. We see David crying out to the Lord while hiding in the cave at En Gedi. We also see Hannah, the mother of Samuel, praying intensely in the temple of the Lord. We also see Jesus pouring his heart out to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Again, let me stress, when you find yourself in the gray nothingness of depression, find a safe place to pour out your heart to God. The second step in navigating the fog of depression is don't neglect the physical for the sake of the spiritual. We all have heard the expression, don't be so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. What does this quip mean for us today? How can we apply its truth to our lives? It's possible that we can become so focused on spiritual activity, such as Bible study, prayer, or even church ministry, that we allow the rest of our life to get out of focus. It's important to realize that God sanctifies the complete human being, body, soul, and spirit. He doesn't just focus on our spiritual qualities and ignore our physical and emotional well-being. How can we love the Lord our God with all our being without recognizing that our body, soul, and spirit is involved in the process? Our walk with Jesus must encompass the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. Going to the gym or taking a walk with our family might be just as spiritual as hours spent in Bible study. Elijah allowed his physical and emotional self to get out of balance. He was exhausted. His struggle with God came about because he frustrated God's sanctification process. For three years, Elijah lived in relative isolation with meager food supplied by ravens. No doubt he was constantly absorbed in his mission to the point that he never had any downtime. Elijah was like a bow that was always bent, and this was trouble waiting to happen. According to Greek myth, Aesop made the following statement, If you keep a bow always bent, it will break eventually, but if you let it go slack, it will be more fit for use when you want it. How true are these words? If we are not careful, we could also stumble like Elijah by frustrating God's sanctification of our triune being. We could build up our spirit through constant prayer and Bible study to the point that we ignore the physical requirements of our body. A simple thing like this could cause us to stumble at being God's servant because we are not physically able. The opposite is also true. We could be mainly focused on building up our body to the neglect of our spirit and soul. We could have a strong outer shell, but our inner man is weak. If we only seek God to minister to our spirit and we neglect the soul, we can end up like the anointed Elijah, able to call fire down from heaven one day and asking God to take him the next. Sometime, the most spiritual thing we can do is take a walk or a nap or drive into the mountains, or even eat our broccoli. It might surprise us that a healthy diet and a physical regimen might help us overcome our depression. 
The third step in navigating the fog of depression is finding your way back to the presence of God. Fog is a deceiver. It distorts the truth. Nothing is in focus. We cannot trust what we see when we're in the fog. The fog of depression is the cruelest of all because it shrouds our relationship with God in a gray nothingness of self-doubt and hopelessness. It is so important that we make the focus of our recovery, finding our way back to the presence of God. Let's return to Elijah once again. It is interesting to note that Elijah was instructed to travel to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is also known as Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. It is the place where Moses received his call and it is where God made his covenant with Israel. The first step back for Elijah was to return to the place that represents covenant with God. Covenant is much more than a legal contract. It is relationship with God. Covenant is the promise. It is the presence of God. God called Elijah to return to his anointing and the promise God made with him. When Elijah reached the cave on Mount Horeb, the word of the Lord came to him. God now asked him a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? At this point, Elijah recounts his losses and his hopelessness. He also expresses his emptiness and limitations Let's read. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. God revealed to Elijah the true relationship with him would never be found in the manifestation of his power, but in a gentle whisper spoken in the heart. After all that Elijah had experienced, God still needed to reteach him how to recognize and seek his presence. God wanted Elijah to realize that relationship with him is more important than being a minister of God. What did Elijah learn on the mountain? He learned that when life becomes unwielding, return to the place of covenant with God. He also learned that should he focus on his losses, he will be destroyed. But should he focus on God, he will receive strength. Elijah also learned that God had more going on behind the scenes than he thought. The school of the prophets had not been destroyed. God had 7,000 held in reserve. What can we glean from Elijah's cave experience? When the fog of depression surrounds you, don't run aimlessly in the desert, but stop and remember the covenant God made with you in Jesus Christ. Return to your own cave of Horeb. Return to that last place where God and you enjoyed relationship. 
Should you focus only on your losses, then you will continue in your desert experience. But should you put your focus on God, then Jesus will slowly burn away your fog. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This verse is very popular in the church, but do we take the time to understand what is being said? We often hear this reference quoted during altar calls, encouraging the wayward sinner to come to Jesus. This reference is much more than an encouragement we memorize. It is a lifestyle we must live. So often when we become weary and burdened, we are overcome with the fog of depression. Elijah needed rest, but he was overwhelmed with grief and hopelessness. His depression reached such a point that he no longer wanted his ministry, and he wanted to die. This is a deep depression. In order for Elijah to find his rest in God once again, he needed to travel for 40 days and nights to Mount Horeb. Elijah found his rest when he rediscovered the gentle whisper of God speaking in his heart. Let's not be too hard on Elijah because we respond to God in the same fashion. When we are at peace with the world and our heart is not troubled with fear and self-doubt, do we still seek God's rest? The answer is usually no. We seek for God's rest usually when we need God's rest. Let's be honest with ourselves. We usually are overwhelmed with fear and self-doubt when we allow our relationship with Jesus to become stagnant. So often, our spiritual fog is the fruit of our treating Jesus with indifference.